Well, good evening, everybody. I hope you can all hear me okay. And we're going to pick up right where we left off last week, sort of. You can imagine that with me, can't you, uh, Dr. Mallard? I'm sure you would agree with that. But nevertheless, um, tune, if you will, to uh, Daniel chapter 7. I know, see, that don't sound like we were in Ephesians 3 there, but turn to Daniel chapter 7. I want to talk to you about something, and then I want to point out a couple of things I did differently on the board here, and maybe we can get some clear sense of uh, the things the Lord wants us to know. And when I say us, I mean us. He didn't give this to any dispensation of time except our dispensation of time. Okay? Daniel chapter 7, it is one of the visions that Daniel saw, and it is about the end time. It's about the, it's about the battle for the world, the earth, at the end of time. So I want you to pick up with me in verse um, uh, 21. Daniel 7, verse 21. Daniel writes, I beheld in the same horn, he's talking about the Antichrist, I beheld in the same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them until the ancient of days came and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High and the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. Thus he said, and he goes on about explaining it, verse 26, but the judgment was set, I'm sorry, but the judgment shall sit and they shall take away his dominion to, to consume and to destroy it unto the end. Now watch, and the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall, shall serve and obey him. Hitherto is the end of the matter. Now, that settles it. That's it. It's over with. Right there, when that occurs, there is no more devil to be handled. There is no more problems with the Lord being in charge and the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven is what I want you to see. So we... We've gone over the uh, creation of the earth many times, and some of you agree with me, and some of you dis some dis I don't give a flip about that. But we've got an earth with a heaven around it, and a kingdom. Uh, I'm sorry, a heaven that is full of stars, whatever you happen to think they are. There's a whole gob of them out there that uh, I, for one, cannot get counted. I tried. I went out last night, started counting them. I got up to twelve, I think. But nevertheless, there's, there it is. There's the earth. There's a heaven that the birds fly in. There is a heaven that is full of stars. And then there's a heaven called the third heaven that Paul went to. And then there's a place above that called the, the place which is called far above all heavens. Now, the Bible says of the Lord, the Bible says forever. O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. So I've got Genesis to Malachi, part of his word. Matthew through John, part of his word. The book of Acts, part of his word. Romans to Philemon, part of his word. And Hebrews through Revelation. That is all the word of God. And it is settled in heaven. That would be the heaven, which is far above all heavens. In other words, the heavens are described one, two, three. And then there is this place far above all heavens. Now, there hadn't been anybody up there except the Lord, except God Almighty, the Father, and the Lord, and the elect angels. They're the only ones up there, and they're the only ones that have ever been up there. And uh, the only one that ever got kicked out of there was an archangel when he got kicked out. His name was Lucifer. Now, I'm not going to dwell on all of that, but there it is. So what's all this space? This is everything below the far above all heavens. Uh, that would be us. 
Now, as time went on, for instance, from Genesis 1 to, I'm going to say 11 for simplicity's sake, those people knew all about who God was, where he was at, also where they were not any longer, as in the Garden of Eden. And there was in the period, of, in, in the fullness of a particular time right in there was a flood that killed all but eight souls. All that were saved were eight, and the Lord started over with them. And by the time you get to chapter 11 of the book of Genesis, there's a whole other world spread out. And then you go from 12 with the introduction to, uh, uh, to the uh, reader of the book, to Abraham, and you come all the way, uh, um, you, you come a, a, about somewhere around 900 years until you get to Moses and the law. And I'm going to put right here D-E-U-T, Dute, as in Deuteronomy. In other words, you got Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and you've come as far as Moses, and the children of Israel are out of Egypt, and they have the law, and the law constitutes something. I want you to now turn to uh, Genesis chapter, I'm sorry, Exodus chapter 19. Exodus 19. And Exodus is the second book in your Bible, and if that's difficult for you, why well, we just have to get a better teacher. Exodus chapter 19, verse 3. Moses has led the children of Israel out of Egypt. Here's what happens next. And Moses went up unto God, and the Lord called unto him out of the mountain, saying, Thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, You have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, and how I bare you on eagles' wings, and brought you unto myself. Now, therefore... If you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and an holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. Moses goes to the children of Israel with these words. Verse 7. And Moses came and called for the elders of the people and laid before their faces all these words which the Lord commanded them. And all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord hath spoken, we will do. The Lord said in verse 5, If ye will. If ye will. Who's the ye? The house of Jacob and the children of Israel. They are the ye, and all of them said, all that the Lord hath spoken, we will do. Whose will was it to bring in the law of Moses to those people of Israel, the house of Jacob? It was the people's will. Say, so, yes, but it was the Lord's word. Oh, yes, it was the Lord's word. And once that word was brought to them, that was their word. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 6. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 6. Verse 1. Deuteronomy 6 verse 1. Now these are the commandments, the statutes, and the judgments which the Lord your God commanded to teach you, that you might do them in the land, whether you go to possess it, that thou mightest fear the Lord thy God, keep all his commandments, on and on it goes. Why? Because that's what they said they were going to do. Wasn't it? Yes, it was. Keep reading. Look down at verse... Um, uh, let's see... Well, start with me in verse 16. You shall not tempt the Lord your God as you tempted him in Massa. You shall dil diligently keep the commandments of the Lord your God and his testimonies and his statutes which he hath commanded thee. And thou shalt do that which is right and good in the sight of the Lord, that it may be well with thee, 
and that thou mayest go in and possess the, the good land which the Lord uh, swear unto thy fathers. Uh, look, look at now verse 21. Then shalt thou, I'm sorry, verse 20. And when thy son casteth, uh, ah, and when thy son asketh thee in time to come, saying, What mean the testimonies and the statutes and the judgments which the Lord our God hath commanded you? Then thou shalt say unto thy son, We were Pharaoh's bondmen in Egypt, and the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand, and the Lord showed signs and wonders great and sore upon Egypt, upon Pharaoh, and upon all his household before our eyes. And he brought us out from thence, that he might bring us in to give us the land which he sware unto our fathers. And the Lord commanded us to do all these statutes, to fear the Lord our God for our good always, that he might preserve us alive as it is at this day. And it, the keeping of those commandments, and it shall be our righteousness if we observe to do all these commandments before the Lord our God, as he hath commanded us. It is a fascinating thing to me that you jump over here about 2,500 years, and now the people over here are saying, well, nobody ever kept the law. That's a bold-faced lie. They did to keep the law. People say, well, they sinned. Well, of course they sinned. The law told them, if you sin, do this, and they did it. If you sin, do this, and they did it. If you sin this way, do this. It's bigger than they did it. The sin this way, it's lesser. Just do this, and they did it. Let me tell you something. Obeying the law meant obeying the law. Didn't mean be perfect. God Almighty knew what he was dealing with. He gave them a law, and he gave them a law with the uh, penance built into it. If you have never taken the time or spent very much time reading the law, I know what it's like to do so. And unless you just really want to do that, you're not compelled to do that. But if you want to know what these people knew, what these people understood, and whether or not they were willing to do it, you go back there and read it. They did it. And when Jesus Christ was born, there was Anna, there was Simeon, and there before him was Zacharias and John the Baptist. They kept that law, dearly beloved. They kept the law. So the law goes on. Here's the law. It's coming across in time, and it gets to Jesus coming. Look in Matthew chapter uh, 3. Matthew 3. In Matthew 3, verse 1, In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. No one ever said that before. John the Baptist is the first to say, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He wasn't the last to say it, but he was the first. In this chapter, he baptizes people, and ultimately he baptizes the Lord Jesus. Look in verse uh, uh, 13. Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? If you go to the book of John, you'll see that John looked at him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God was taken away the sin of the world. He wants John to baptize him? Notice what Jesus says, verse 15. And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him, and Jesus was baptized. What was the righteousness he was fulfilling? It was the righteousness which is of the law. How do you know that? Because when, until Jesus Christ, after Jesus Christ was baptized, there wasn't any, any other law in effect except the righteousness of the law, which was given to Moses in order for the people to obey all commandments. That law. And remember, the bulk of them didn't do it, but some of them did it. They're called a remnant, and in several other places. They're called a couple of other things, but never mind for that now. Now look in Matthew chapter 5, after the Lord starts his ministry. Notice what he says of the law. He says to his disciples, verse 1 says that he sees a multitude, but he's talking to his disciples, and he gives them the, what's commonly called the Beatitudes, the things that create blessing and, and uh, cursing. Notice, if you will, in verse 13, ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? 
it is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden underfoot of men. If you ever want to understand what the law is worth in the life of an individual Israelite, right there it is. If it's savorous to the people who took it, it's the salt of the earth. But if it lost its savor, it was nothing but dross, cast it out and trod it underfoot. Well, now, if you read what Jesus said in the book of Matthew about the, uh, the uh, scribes and Pharisees and hypocrites and lawyers, you'll find out what that meant. They were the ones being trodden down. Uh, the word of God was the same, but the, but the people that handled the word of God were not handling it the way the Lord wanted it handled. And all of a sudden, it became as dross. No salt, no savor, no light. That's the world Jesus Christ came unto. Notice now he says, verse 14, Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on the hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Who's supposed to be seen so well that people see the good works? These disciples Jesus is talking to here when he's talking to them on, at the Sermon on the Mount, and he's talking to them about the law that they have in their possession. Keep reading. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I'm not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, Till all be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. He has just laid something on them, as he said after he washed their feet in John chapter 13, you don't even know what I've done to you. Watch this. Verse 21. You have heard that it was said by them of old time, thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of judgment, of the judgment. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. Is that slightly less than killing him? Well, it was till now. Angry without a cause? Wow. Notice verse um, 27. You have heard that it was said by them of old time, thou shalt not commit adultery. The law of Moses said that. Keep reading. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. Did the law just get a lot stricter? Yes, it did. To whom? These disciples. There's an answer for that later. Just hang in there. Notice the very next verse. Verse 29. And if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out. Did the law of Moses ever tell anybody to do any harm to their body? Oh, no. Did the law, as Jesus described it to the disciples, tell them to do harm to their body if it was going to protect them against breaking the law? Yes, it did. Was Jesus kidding around about that? I don't think so. He didn't do that kind of thing. Same thing about the hand and so forth. Notice, this gets even stricter the further you go. He says, um, uh, look, if you will, in um, verse 43. You have heard that it have been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies. What? He just made the law all the tougher in, these, in the minds and hearts and lives of these disciples. Don't you understand? Well, why? Because of what they were. Notice he says in Matthew chapter 21. Matthew 20. Uh, I'm sorry. Stop in 19. Matthew 19. He chose the 12. He gave them names. I mean, they were named in, in chapter 10 and so forth. Look now, if you will, in verse uh, Matthew 19, verse 16. And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good things shall I do that I may have eternal life? Notice the Lord Jesus Christ does not tell him how to have eternal life. Watch carefully. And he said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. 
He saith unto him, Which? Jesus said, Thou shalt do no murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness. Honor thy father and thy mother, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. The young man saith unto him, All these things have I kept from my youth up. What lack I yet? Jesus did not rebuke him. Jesus saith unto him, said unto him, If thou wilt be perfect, He's going to be given the rules for entering into life here. He says, if thou wilt be perfect, go and sell that thou hast and give to the poor and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. And come and follow me. Guy wouldn't do it. This befuddles the 12 apostles. Look down to verse 27. Then answered Peter and said unto him, behold, we have forsaken all. <clears throat> Behold, we have forsaken all and followed thee. What shall we have therefore? And Jesus said unto them, the 12 apostles, Verily I say unto you that ye which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit on the throne of his glory, you also shall sit upon 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. What kind of an individual sits on a throne? A king does. These guys are called 12 kings with judgment power. So I know that somewhere out there from here, Jesus Christ, I think I got more than 12 there, but Jesus Christ promised them 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Okay? This is all in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Notice now in chapter 21, Matthew 21, Jesus just promised them big things, right? Verse 23, And when he was come into the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came unto him as he was teaching and said, "By what?" And they began to ask him questions. So he gives them, starting in verse 33, he gives them a parable. And the parable is about what happened. The parable is about what happened to all of this. What happened? Why caused it all to get like it is right here where Jesus is living? Notice verse 40. In the parable, they killed the son of the, of the master. Verse 40. When the Lord, therefore, of the vineyard cometh, what will he do unto those husbandmen, the ones who killed the son of the master? Verse 41. They, chief priests and elders of the people, they say unto him, He will miserably destroy those wicked men and will let out his vineyard unto other husbandmen which shall render him the fruits in their seasons. Jesus saith unto them, Did you never read in the Scriptures the stone which the builders rejected the same as become the head of the corner? This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore say I, the Lord Jesus Christ, unto you, the guys who have had all of this kingdom all these hundreds and hundreds of years, Therefore say I unto thee, uh, verse, uh, you, verse 43, I'm sorry, verse 43, yes. Therefore say I, Jesus Christ, unto you, the chief priests and the elders, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. Then out of this, in expectation, comes a nation. This nation had been given a law in Matthew 5, 6, and 7 stricter than the law of Moses. Go to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. In Acts chapter 1, Jesus is talking to these same guys that he promised a, a, a throne unto. Same ones. Say, well, Judas Iscariot's gone. Doesn't make any difference. Matthias was there. He was. Acts chapter 1, verse um, 4. And being assembled together with them, the twelve, uh, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, you have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be, watch, baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? Well, here they are. They are a new nation. They're fixing to get baptized with
the Holy Ghost, baptized with the Holy Ghost as a nation, you understand, the nations, 12 men, the whole nation's going to get baptized with the Holy Ghost. Right there. That's what it said. He's going to give this whole kingdom of God issue back here that was on the earth all of this time. He's going to give it over to a nation, bringing forth the fruits there of it, uh, of it there. And then this nation is formed with these 12 men. Luke chapter 12, verse 32, he says, Fear not, little flock. It is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. The kingdom he's referring to is the kingdom of God. What are they called? All the way through Matthew, they are called the kingdom of heaven. With a law stricter than the law of Moses. Here's how they do it. He just told them, uh, verse 5, you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. They want to know about Israel. Verse 7, he said unto them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. Watch, but you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Go to chapter 2, verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, began to speak with tongues, etc. Now that's the 12 apostles. So by the time you get to chapter 4, go to chapter 4, you've got thousands and thousands of people who have believed Peter and the, and the 11s uh, preaching. They have gotten baptized in the name of Jesus. They have sold out, and they have all things common. You can catch up to that yourself. Look in Acts chapter 4, verse 31. And when they had prayed, every one of them, thousands of them, and when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. All of them. Well, that includes a young man named Stephen. And the Lord Jesus Christ had decreed back in Matthew that if you sin against him, you'll be forgiven. And the first words out of his mouth on the cross were, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. But he also decreed that if you sin, if a man sinned against the black, uh, sin, if it sinned against the Holy Ghost, if he, if he blasphemed the Holy Ghost and sinned against the Holy Ghost, he could not be forgiven in this world. Neither could he be allowed to go into or be forgiven in this world to come over here in the future somewhere. No forgiveness. And so there's Stephen, a man full of the Holy Ghost, and his spirit could not be contained, and he was preaching. And a guy named Saul blasphemed the Holy Ghost by encouraging, rioting, if you will, holding the coats of them that killed him. And the chapter 8, Acts chapter 8, it says that Saul was consenting unto his death. That's the stand against him. And it says in verse 3, as for Saul, he made havoc of the church, which means he was going right after people filled with the Holy Ghost. Look in chapter 9, verse 1. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, he does it again, triple dose that time. He breathed out threatenings and slaughter. That's two different sins, threatening and actually doing it. And then he got letters from Damascus to go do it worse. This guy's doomed. He cannot be forgiven in this world, and he can't be forgiven in the future anywhere. And yet the Lord, with a light, knocked him to the ground in Acts chapter 9 and began to talk to him. And he had Ananias go down and see him, and he told Ananias, he's going to suffer great things for me. And so in our Bible, we've been looking in the book of Acts, and now we see that Paul came and wrote these words right here. Now if we come over here to Hebrews through Revelation, then we're going to have prophecy fulfilled. Hundreds and hundreds of prophecies will be fulfilled according to the books of Hebrews through Revelation. You come all the way back over here, and it picks up and even includes Enoch out of Genesis chapter 4, 4 or 5, whichever it is, 5, I guess. Enoch is in that 
prophecy fulfilled over there. And uh, Noah is, and Abraham is, and Moses is, and all of the prophets of the Old Testament, all of them. And then of the things, the words of the Lord Jesus Christ, hundreds of them fulfilled over here in the future. But this guy, Paul, who couldn't get saved here, and he for sure can't be saved over there, he got saved here. Now that isn't just simply miraculous. This is overwhelmingly perfect will, not of you, not of a few tribes, not of the Levites, and not the will of the Father through the Son using the 12 disciples, the 12 apostles. This is the will of God. Go to Ephesians chapter 1. In the, middle of, in the midst of what Paul wrote, as you're going through it, you've got Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians. Fifth book. In books which are written to children, <laughs> children, me and you, in books which are written to the churches, the groups of people, you've got Romans, Ephe I'm sorry, Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1 Thessalonians, and 2 Thessalonians, that's nine. The middle book is Ephesians. Okay, so I got Ephesians here. And back here on this side, I got four books here. I got Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Galatians. Over here, I've got Philippians. Oops. I've got Philippians, Colossians, 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians. And so it's a triangle with Ephesians at the top. But on the other hand, there are 13 books that Paul wrote. And if I go 13 books, then I have to get to the seventh book to have it in the middle. So that would be Ephesians is five, Philippians is six. Colossians is seven. So I'm going to put Colossians right there. And then I've got uh, Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, and Philippians. That's six. Over here, I've got uh, 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, Titus, and Philemon. One, two, three, four, five, six. That's six. So I've got another triangle, and Colossians is in the middle of it. Now, ladies and gentlemen, you've just figured it out. Did you see that? You've just figured it out. To the groups of people that Paul wrote to, Ephesians is the epitome of it all. It's the crowning. It is the chief cornerstone. But to everyone in general, including the preachers who preach, including the people who don't like other people, prejudiced people. I'll get to that in a minute. The center book of that, the chief cornerstone of that is Colossians. Guess which two books in your Bible are just like you and me, Ephesians and Colossians. Ain't that a kick in the head? You know who doesn't like this? Churches. Churches don't like this. This flies in the face of who they think they are. Most of them think they're the outcropping of the 12 apostles. They couldn't keep up with one of the 25 things in the book of uh, Matthew 5, 6, and 7 that the Lord told them they must do. Go back and read them. Nobody keeps up with that stuff. Nobody does. You don't know anybody who, fit, who fits the picture of the Beatitudes. The first time I ever paid any attention to the words spoken at a state funeral was Hubert Humphrey. And he believed, he, he believed this about himself, and it was quoted in his, in his uh, eulogy. He believed that he was going to be, he was a peacemaker, and he was going to be, uh, inherit the earth. Let him have it. Whatever that beatitude was, I may have it wrong about the earth. Thought he was one of, blessed are the peacemakers. He thought he was a peacemaker. Bless your soul, he was a, a uh, vice president in a time with the worst horrible war going on in America, or with America in it, that's ever gone on. Called himself a peacemaker. He well, I believed in it. Well, I believed in it. Wasn't a thing I could do about it. There wasn't anything he could do about it either. Voices bigger than mine and old Humphreys had it all going on over there. 
Listen, folks, you don't know anybody in the world. You can't find anybody that can do any of this legitimately. They can phony it. They're not part of this prophecy over here being fulfilled. They were never part of the law of Moses or any such thing as that. But you can find all of us, every one of us, you can find in Romans through Philemon. You can find with the capstone books of Ephesians and Colossians spoken directly to us. I'm just getting started. I haven't even gotten to the point yet. Go to, did I say go to Ephesians 1 while ago and then I didn't go? Ephesians 1. Turn to Ephesians 1. I'm going to take some of this off here. You know, the reason for a board such as this is it is an aid, but mainly it's not an aid to you. It's an aid to me. Sometimes when I come in the next morning and look at this board, I have the bogus idea what I used all that for. But while I'm here and doing it, I, I, know, I know why I'm doing it. In other words, I know what I want to put on the board, or why I want to put that on the board. So let me just say here, in this blank space now, I want us to look at some things that are in Ephesians and Colossians, and that it, it demands that we go some other places too. But this is us. This is the area known by Bible words as the church, which is the body of Christ. The body of Christ as a group of people, the body of Christ is nowhere else in your Bible. Going backwards, nowhere else going forward. The church, which is the body of Christ, is found in the book of Romans through Philemon only. It's in a time frame that is referred to as the dispensation of grace, of the grace of God. The dispensation of grace so that God is a gracious God, whether you're in Genesis chapter uh, 1 or whether you're in Revelation 22. But though God is gracious, the dispensation of grace is not spoken anywhere except in Ephesians. A dispensation given to Paul of God is spoken of in Colossians. A dispensation of the gospel is spoken of in 1 Corinthians 9. And a dispensation of the fullness of times is prophesied by the Apostle Paul. And, and by, I might add, explained by the Apostle Paul. Now, in Ephesians chapter 1, let me remind you, God made man in his own image, man fell. God brought his, his children of Israel out of Egypt, and he said, if you will, I will. And they said, we will, we will, we will. So you found out it was their will. They took that law unto themselves, of their own free will. And then they didn't keep the law. But now, the great but nows, you're in the midst of them here. But now, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Now here you go. This is in Romans to Philemon. It is unto the church, the body of Christ. And ultimately, this is about the dispensation of the grace of God. And he said that he has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. In, um, uh, in Christ. And verse 4, according as he hath chosen us in him, chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy without blame before him in love. Now, let me tell you something. When you stand before God Almighty, you will be, if you've trusted in the gospel, the saving power of the gospel of Christ, if you've trusted in Christ, when you stand before God Almighty, you will give an account of yourself, but you will stand there 
holy and without blame before him in the love of Jesus Christ. It won't be about whether or not God sees your sins. He won't. Why? Because he loves his son. And his son loved you enough to give himself for you. When Paul said, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, he said, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God. What? Do you think you've ever been guilty of frustrating the grace of God? I don't even know most of you that well. And I would say, yes, you have. You have frustrated the grace of God. You know, God forgave you in Christ Jesus over 2,000 years ago, or about 2,000 years ago. Hey, I, practically every one of us has tried to get God to forgive us of something. Oh, God, forgive me. I hate the casual use. I know God will forgive me for this, but God will have to forgive me for this, but come on, folks. He's already forgiven you. All trespasses. So nevertheless, here he says, God hath chosen us in Christ before the foundation of the world. Sometimes it gets difficult. See, I'm off camera here. And yet, here I am. That's a dance move, by the way. I want you to know that. I was chosen in Christ back there, behind the board, the other side of the board. But I'm alive over here in Christ. How about you? Are you alive in Christ? Do you believe Christ died for your sins, was buried, was raised for your justification? Did you trust that for your salvation? You were over there too. But you're living here. I'm not saying that clear enough. You all would just be nodding up and down and shouting hallelujah if I said, come on, folks, before the foundation of the world, you were chosen in Christ. <clears throat> he really mean that? Yes, he does. Notice, according as he, had, verse 4, <clears throat> according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself. God used Jesus Christ as the agency to make you his child having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. Not our will. His will. Not our will. Like the, like the Jews with the law. No, no, no. That's their will. Our will is subrogated to his will. Notice, verse 6, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein, in this grace, wherein he has made us accepted in the beloved. We couldn't be in the, God, in the grace of God if we weren't in the beloved. The beloved is Jesus Christ. Verse 7, in whom, the beloved, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, which means you can't out-give the riches of his grace, wherein he hath abounded to us and toward us in all wisdom and prudence. Now watch carefully, having made known unto us, you and me and Paul, and these Ephesians who didn't know Doodlem, even you knew more about God than these Ephesians did, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, not our will, not Israel's will. God Almighty's will. According to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself. See who's in charge here? Not us. We're not in charge. We wouldn't have anything except that the Lord gave us grace in the midst of his will. Verse 10. 
that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he, that's God Almighty, still talking about God the Father, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated, now watch, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. Do you realize that all the leadership for all the world back here, I don't care, you go from Adam down through Enoch, through Methuselah, right into Noah, and then you come to Abraham, all the way to Moses, another 500 years over to David, right on down till the kingdom is no more, and you go into the 400 silent years before Matthew chapter 1, all of that time, all of that time, is included in how did the Lord work all this out in verse 11. Read verse 11 again. God, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. Now stop and reiterate to yourself I know his will. You're reading it. And it included everybody. So now, I will go back here, and you probably can't see it, but I, I put a blue dotted line up here, representing where the Lord's word is settled in heaven. And all the rest of it, as I said a while ago, is earth <clears throat> and the three heavens named in the Bible, First, second, third heaven named in the Bible. They're all down here, all below his word. He has magnified his word above his name, Psalm 138, verse 2 says. And so there it is. It's right there. There's nothing wrong with his word, and there's nothing that will not be fulfilled out of his word. Whatever he said is going to happen is going to happen. And here in Ephesians, You got it. See, how did I get it? By grace, through faith, plus nothing, God did it for Christ's sake. It's his will. Now notice verse 12. That we should breathe the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. Be Paul, because it said we. That in, includes Paul. And then to the Ephesians, he says, in verse 13, he says, in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Wow, sealed. Sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession under the praise of his glory. Why is it going to be to the praise of his glory? Why should an idiot like me, blah, 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 idiot like me, get to be unto the praise of his glory? Why should you? Why should anybody else? Do? You know, somebody said, uh, uh, said, that guy may be saved, but he is a scoundrel. That guy may be saved, but he's a crook. That guy may be, well, what's that mean when he goes there and stands before the Lord? He's going to be holy and without blame before him in the love of Christ. Christ died for that idiot. And he, I'm sorry. Christ died for that poor guy just like he died for me and you. And you may not like him. You don't have to like him. But if he's got a testimony of Jesus Christ saving him, bless your soul, you better call him brother. You'd be remiss if you didn't call him brother or she sister. Salvation's simple. Salvation's not complicated. Salvation's easy. Oh, there you go, preaching that easy believism. Yes, I am. Jump on it. 
Christ died for your sins, was buried, was raised for your justification. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. What the heck are you waiting for anyway? You going to figure it out? You going to see how you fit in? You don't fit in. The Lord's going to put you in. So when you trust Christ as your Savior, and all of his is yours, where are you going to go? You're on the earth. What good would it do you to fly through the air above the earth? I don't think you can go out and sit down on some star someplace. I think they're kind of hot. Where are you going to go? Oh, the Bible says you're going to go ever to be with the Lord. He's going to change your vile body and have it fashioned like unto his glorious body. Well, why would he do a thing like that? He wants to. It's his will. Turn to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians 1. Notice in verse 9. <clears throat> for this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to, be, and to desire that you might be filled with the wisdom. Ah, blah, 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 blah. Verse 9. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness, giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom the Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who, the Son, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him, the Son, were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence, for it pleased the Father. Wow! Wow! For it pleased the Father that in him Christ should all fullness dwell. Look in chapter 2. Verse 8 says, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, denominationalism, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. For in him, in Christ, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him him. How'd this all come about? And how did God work all this out? Well, number one, he's God. But look here, verse 11, in whom also you, ye are circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, a circumcision made without hands. Now watch what that circumcision cuts away. In putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Christ was circumcised away from the cross. His body was freed from his spirit and his soul. The body went into the grave. The soul went to hell. And the spirit went back to God, which gave it. And three days and three nights later, the soul comes back out gets in that body which had not seen any corruption in three days and then goes up into heaven and is glorified. You can say spiritualized right there if you want to. And he comes back with a spiritual body, physical, oh yes, but spiritual. And he says through the apostle Paul, he says, Jerry, you and these people are here on this, on this video here listening to you here. You're going to have one of them too. 1 Corinthians 15, Philippians chapter 3, you're going to have a spiritual body. It's going to be like his body. Colossians chapter 2, here's what happened. Verse 12, uh, verse 11, in whom also ye are circumcised, verse 12, buried with him in baptism, 
Christ was buried, and the baptism was the baptism of death, buried with him in baptism. The identification with death was done by Jesus Christ. How can you identify with death? See yourself dead. I'll get back to that in a second. Verse 12. Buried with him in baptism, wherein also you are risen with him. Oh, you didn't stay dead. Through the faith of the operation of God. God performed an operation, and it included you, even though you weren't born for 1,900 plus years. But the operation of God included you. Keep reading. Buried with him in baptism, <clears throat> wherein also, also you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who has raised him from the dead, and you being dead in your sins, and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. So here you are in the flesh in an uncircumcised condition where God is concerned, and God, by the spiritual circumcision mentioned in chapter 2, verse 11, is going to circumcise you just like Christ was circumcised at the cross, and he's going to take you into hell, going to take you figuratively into the grave, and he's going to take you figuratively out of the grave and glorify you in his Son. Now look in chapter 3, verse 2. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth, for you're dead. So it said, for you are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall you also appear with him in glory. Next week, and we'll talk more about the appearings. So then he tells you some things that would fit your lifestyle better if you would do them. And I, I, I'll leave that right there for, right, for this moment. But notice, if you will, in, verse, uh, in chapter 3, verse... Um, um, well, pick up in verse 22. It's after a long list of uh, husbands and wives and children and so forth. Notice verse 22. Servants obey in all things your masters according to, to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but watch now, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. And whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord you shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. What are we left with? We're left with a life to live in service for the Lord Jesus Christ, in the service of the Lord Jesus Christ, in service unto the Lord Jesus Christ. You serve the Lord Christ. Verse 25 says, But he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done. Oh, There's some retribution. Receiving for the wrong doesn't throw you out of the Lord's kingdom. You've already been translated into the kingdom. You can't get untranslated. So what have we got? The perfect will of God. Now, here's all of creation. Up there's heaven. Down here's everything that's gone on. We're over here in this time. We've got all this over here left in the future. Like Daniel said, all this is going to happen over here. And when, that's done, when all of that's done, everything's going to be all about the kingdom. And the kingdom is going to be the kingdom of God, as Paul preached from Acts chapter 9 all the way through Acts chapter 28, as the 12 apostles preached as long as they preached Acts, after Acts chapter 1, and on and on and on. The kingdom of God is the kingdom of God. That's all of it. But you and I, we are translated into the kingdom of God's dear Son. The 12 apostles are in the kingdom of heaven, and they bring in another... 144,000 plus over here that go in that kingdom with them. And there's a kingdom back here in the land because 81 times God promised that land to those who would be faithful to him. And there were always some faithful to him. They're going to get that. You can't deny them. You might ought not to try. There are three inheritances. There are three kingdoms. And if the Lord has more, that'll be all right. But he's got three. Now, here's the thing. We're the epitome. That's why I did those triangle things there a while ago. We are the epitome. Are we the best? Oh, no. 
We're the last. However, the Lord said the last shall be first and the first shall be last. Mark that with your kingdomisms. The first kingdom, they don't get resurrected until the start of the thousand year reign of Christ. The second kingdom, they are martyred for the Lord during the seven year tribulation and they're resurrected almost immediately. But you and I leave here before the seven year starts. We're last, but we go first. I'm ready. How about you? I thank you all for being here tonight. I hope it's been a blessing to you. Uh, it'll be on the Brother Jerry Lockhart um, uh, YouTube page tomorrow morning by 8 o'clock, hopefully. Right now, I'm going to turn this recording off.